Hello and welcome back. Today we're talking about gold derivatives and comparing the advantages and disadvantages to owning physical gold. Before we begin, please take a moment to like and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you. Investors in gold and other precious metals have a choice. And we appreciate that they choose to invest in physical bullion. But there is always a lingering question about whether someone should invest in an ETF or gold mining stocks or some other derivative product rather than the physical metal. We're going to cover the pros and cons of each and give some examples covering a few different concepts, including cost, risk, and liquidity. Let's start with the most interesting, cost. Any investment you make will have an associated cost. You can't invest in anything for free. And when we're talking about investments, you have the buy and the sell price of that investment, also sometimes expressed as the bid and the ask. The difference between the two is the spread. Generally speaking, investors prefer to buy into an investment with a lower spread. This makes it easier to achieve a positive return on investment. In other words, the less you spend on an investment, the less it has to grow for you to make money off it. The cost of holding physical bullion is well known. Buying an ounce of gold carries a premium. This is the cost for a company like Appmex to sell the gold and turn a profit, but there's also a premium that we pay to our suppliers. This ensures that mints and mines also get a fair chance of turning a profit so the people doing the work can be paid. So far, pretty simple. One fee, one time to hold physical metal. Gold derivatives, like an ETF, are a little more complex. To keep it really simple, you can buy and sell gold derivative products like an ETF or an ETN through a brokerage, just as you could for any regular stock. You can also buy a gold miner's stock or gold miner's ETF. So there's a lot of options for someone who wants exposure to gold in their portfolio. But how does that compare to buying physical bullion? When we're looking at cost of a financial product like an ETF, there are two main considerations. Your brokerage fees, which we can't compare to or comment on. Some people are paying fees for advisory services or trading on margin, for example, while others are completely self-service and making an effort to minimize their fees. The second cost we're looking at that is much easier to discuss are the fees associated with the ETF or ETN, also called an expense ratio. The average expense ratio of a gold ETF is 0.65%. This is the fee you will pay each year to be invested in the fund. Now, some of you know where this is going. A 0.65% expense ratio is pricey, especially if you're staying invested in a product for a long time and if you're increasing that investment. Let's do some quick math. Gold's annual rate of return between 1971 and 2022 was 7.78%. We're going to pretend your ETF has the exact same rate of return as physical gold for the sake of comparison. And we're also going to pretend that you had an initial investment of $10,000 and invested another $5,000 each year. If you did this for 10 years, you would have invested $60,000 total. The premium on physical gold coins varies by product, but a 5% premium on gold bullion is decently common. Your cost to be invested in gold over 10 years in physical bullion would be $3,000 under this scenario. Your cost in the ETF is $4,035 at 20 years. Your investment in physical bullion would be 5,500, but because the ETF has an expense ratio of 0.65%, your ETF would cost over $23,000. The longer you stay in and the more your investments grow, the higher the total cost becomes. At 30 years under this scenario, you would have invested 160,000. With a 5% premium in physical bullion, your cost to hold tangible gold bars or coins is $8,000. The ETF at 0.65% is over 84,000. Physical bullion has a distinct cost advantage that grows the longer you hold it. On the flip side, some ETFs make up for higher expense ratios or declining rates of return by offering a dividend yield. 
But while dividends are generally an excellent component of a portfolio, for these types of ETFs, it seems to be mainly used to prevent flight from underperforming funds. And there's a secondary downside to dividend yield as well. For example, GLDI is a gold ETN that operates using a covered call strategy. It's not a very popular product, even though the yield is over 13%, probably because its value has done nothing but decline since 2013 when it opened over $400 per share. Most recently, it closed at $135 per share. Providing the dividend yield helps keep investors in the black so they don't leave and force the fund to shut down entirely. However, dividends are taxable. Even if you reinvest those dividends, it's still taxed. So the yield helps a bit, but I think you can start to see the problem with investing in a financial product that has an annual recurring expense and annual tax liabilities. And now that we're talking about tax, there's an interesting point to be made here. Not all commodity ETFs are taxed the same. We strongly encourage you to consult with a professional before investing in a commodity ETF understand what those tax liabilities are going to look like. It will vary depending on how the fund is structured. Some of them have hybrid rates where the annual gain, regardless of distribution, is taxed. Some are not taxed till the shares are sold. Some are taxed at ordinary income rates, and some are taxed at capital gains rates. When you're trying to compare financial products, the tax rules can just be a nightmare to deal with. Most of us do not enjoy trying to figure out whether we need to file a Schedule K-1 or Form 1099. Gold bullion is much simpler, though it does have some tax rules as well. We have a section on our knowledge center at learn.atmex.com to help spell out what your tax liabilities are in each state. For an investor that's planning to play a short-term game with gold, holding it for a year or two maybe and trying to flip it quickly, then an ETF or ETN does sometimes have a lower spread, but choose your financial instrument carefully as there are many gold derivative products that have underperformed both the broader market and the underlying physical asset. And that brings us to point number two, risk. Humans are just bad at assessing risk. It's well known and well documented and it's often influenced by our emotions. For example, we know the odds of winning the Powerball are about one in 300 million. Yet with high hopes, Americans spend roughly $100 billion on lottery tickets each year. Some people put thousands of dollars into it to increase their odds. In one semi-famous case, a woman started GoFundMe to recoup the family's life savings that she spent on lottery tickets. Although it's an extreme example, it's a good anecdote to showcase just how poor humans are at judging risk. So let's talk about the risks we have with each investment type. A physical gold investment does have some risk. The risk of fire or theft exists. And while that can be mitigated, it's still there. And there's risk associated with an ETF or other derivative product as well, though in a different form. The concept of counterparty risk or contractual risk is present in brokerages and fund managers. In a recent example from 2022, Alliance Global was found guilty of fraud and fined billions of dollars in restitution for lying about performance to investors and the SEC while managing a complex derivative product. There's also a risk that the brokerage isn't dealing square. Another example would be Schwab's 2022 fine for misleading customers about the way its robo-advisor services work. While it was advertised as a portfolio designed to deliver optimal returns with no hidden fees, what they actually did was sweep the cash in those portfolios to its affiliate bank, loan it out, and then keep the difference between interest earned on loans and what it paid in interest to robo-advisor clients. This was obviously not a portfolio optimized for returns, and their own internal analysis showed it would underperform the market. Schwab paid a $187 million fine to the SEC. The big question here is whether the risk of fire and home burglary is greater or lower than the risk of fraud or other errors resulting in contractual risk by investment managers or brokerages. It's relatively simple to calculate the risk of fire or theft, for theft, you can look up the home burglary rate for your area and figure out your risk. Across the US, the average number is less than half a percent of homes are subjected to a burglary. The odds of a house fire are about 1 in 850, and of the house fires in the US, very few result in homes completely burning down. So the odds of a burglary or all-consuming fire are low. 
figuring out the odds for a fund manager or brokerage committing fraud is more difficult. It's prevalent enough to require an enforcement division within the SEC that works around the clock. In 2022, they brought 760 enforcement actions, which was a 9% increase over the prior year. In addition, the total dollar amount the SEC brought in enforcement actions was a record 6.4 billion, up from $3.8 billion the year prior. This doesn't directly answer our question though, it just verifies that fraud exists and we have to enforce the rules for them to be followed. And in any system with rules, you will also have rule breakers. You might also look at volatility as a measure of risk. For volatility, it varies so much, and we don't really find this to be a great measure of risk. GLDI, for example, uh, we're gonna pick on this one a little bit, it has a beta that's lower than physical gold, meaning it's less volatile, but it also has terrible returns and a long history of underperformance. It has been less volatile, but it's also been on a very clean downward trend. To sum it up, we can generally gauge the risk of fire and theft as low and investing in financial products as unknown. A multitude of studies have shown that the risk of fraud increases the more complex the financial product becomes and the less transparent it is. If fund managers are citing competitive advantage to hide key information, for example, that's a red flag. If you do prefer a derivative over physical gold, please do your research carefully first on the product you're considering investing in. Just as you might research the level of crime in a neighborhood you're considering moving to, you should actively work to reduce your risk exposure to shady financial products. And the last point we're going to cover is liquidity. There's no debate here. A popular gold ETF is going to be very liquid and very easy to buy and sell much more so than physical gold that requires some legwork to buy and sell. It's up to you to decide whether this is a benefit or not. In most cases, we like things that are easier. But be honest with yourself. If you've ever bought or sold stock or another investment emotionally and maybe bought high and sold low, then making it really easy to hit the buy or sell button might not be an advantage. Making things just a little less accessible might give you the breathing room to ride out a rough patch where prices are down a little bit and make clearer decisions. To sum it up, if you're long into gold, holding physical bullion does have a cost advantage and carries low risk. Taxes are not extremely clear for either physical gold bullion or for ETFs, but bullion does have the edge in terms of simplicity. If you want something with greater liquidity, popular gold derivatives are generally easier to buy and sell. You can do it near instantaneously from the comfort of your home. Overall, we think the edge goes to physical bullion, but some investors might find some of the attributes of a gold ETF to be a good fit for their investment strategy or portfolio. Regardless what you choose, we hope you do your due diligence and research thoroughly before investing. That's all we have for you today. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.